This is the story of Columbia. This video will be a bit different from the ones that I've done. Long-term viewers of the channel will find this video very similar to the ones that I used to do when this channel was just starting out. I'm going to play videos of the space shuttle because this video required a lot of research and I didn't really get time to do a simulation, per se. With that out of the way, let's get to the video. Ever since I was a little child, I was fascinated with the space shuttle. When I was seven, I literally read everything I could about the space shuttle that I could manage to get my hands on. The destruction of Columbia really hit me hard. So this video will be a tribute to Columbia. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into what happened on that fateful day. You see, I'm a nerd and all the documentaries that I've watched never really go into the technical details of what happened as she re-entered Earth's atmosphere for the last time on that day. That is what this video will be. Just to clarify, I'm not really going to talk about what happened on launch, which caused the crash of Columbia, because that's been talked about ad nauseum. This will be a minute-by-minute -minute rundown of what went down, and hopefully you learn something new about Columbia. We need to start from the top, and for the sake of simplicity, this video will be divided up into five phases. Phase 1 is from 9.15am and 30 seconds GMT to 1.44pm and 9 seconds GMT. This phase deals with the prep work that was done prior to re-entry. We join the Space Shuttle Columbia as she is preparing to start her descent down towards the runway. We have a pretty good idea of what's happening in the orbiter at this point as we recovered tapes from the orbiter that survived the fall to Earth. So there was footage and we were able to see exactly what everyone was up to in the orbiter. On the morning of re-entry day, they were busy putting things away and prepping Columbia to land. 45 minutes before the retro rockets would be fired to bring Columbia back down, the commander and the pilot began to run through checklists that they needed to do. Then at 1 p.m., 15 minutes and 30 seconds GMT, the deorbit burn occurred. The burn wasn't that long, but it was enough that Columbia's path now took it into the upper reaches of the atmosphere. They were now on their way down. At 1.36 and 4 seconds GMT, the commander accidentally bumped the rotational hand controller, this wasn't a big deal and happened all the time because the crew were wearing these bulky suits and gloves. And sometimes you bumped into things. It's not the end of the world. And from there, the crew recovered from it pretty quickly. This is where phase two starts from 1.44 p.m. and 9 seconds GMT. This is when the shuttle reached its entry interface point. We have even more data sources for this phase. Ground-based recording devices could now start to see Columbia streaking into the atmosphere, and the OEX recorder, Columbia's equivalent of a flight data recorder, was also recording sensor data. We also had transmissions from the shuttle itself to piece together what was happening on board. At this point, the shuttle was doing what was known as roll reversals. This is basically where the shuttle banks from side to side, in a way, to mitigate the heat that would be starting to build up on the space shuttle as it entered Earth's atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. Think Mach 25. But unknown to the crew of Columbia, she was starting to shed pieces. But it was nothing serious enough that the crew would have noticed. As Columbia entered the Earth's atmosphere, the leading edge of the wings and the nose were experiencing temperatures that reached 2800 Fahrenheit. Now, on a normal re-entry, the TPS, or the Thermal Protective System, would well protect the shuttle. But due to the gaping hole in Columbia's wing, the protective system was not doing a whole lot of protecting. Superheated gases were now being funneled into the left wing of Columbia at unimaginably high speeds. The wing of the space shuttle was starting to lose its properties. This would not be good. At 1.49 and 32 seconds GMT, a roll to the right was made to manage energy. Then, at 1.51 and 46 seconds, the first sign of trouble. The space shuttle was starting to yaw a bit to the left. The yaw values were still within limits of previous shuttle flights, but this was concerning. This was happening because the aerodynamic properties of the left wing had been changed by the hole that had been punched into it. But by 1.52 and 5 seconds, the flight computer detected that something was wrong with the orbiter. The left wing was generating way too much drag and pulling the orbiter in that direction. To compensate for this, the computer commanded a little bit of aileron trim. Now, as the re-entry sequence continued, the amount of trim on the left aileron increased but this wasn't noticed by the crew. At this point, superheated plasma was being funneled into the left wing of Columbia by the hypersonic airflow. For all intents and purposes, a massive blowtorch had been turned on in the left wing of Columbia. Things were not going well. 
This massive heat meant that sensors on the left wing started to fail. At 1.52 and 17 seconds, the left wheel well temperature sensor showed an off nominal temperature. Mission Control noticed that something was weird when four hydraulic return line temperature sensors went off the charts literally and then failed. Now, one sensor failing, that's just bad luck. But four within a few seconds of each other, now that's something more sinister. They had never seen anything like this before. No one had prepped for this, and this set off alarm bells, and people were scrambling to figure out what was happening to Columbia. At 1.53 and 15 seconds, the first picture of Columbia from the ground was taken by people who had woken up at an ungodly hour to see the marvel of people coming back from space engulfed in a streak of fire. Unknown to them, as they watched on, at 1.53 and 38 seconds GMT, the left yaw or the bank on Columbia had reached values never before seen on any space shuttle mission. At 1.52 and 46 seconds, the video picks up something small separating away from Columbia. This was debris one, the first piece to fall off of the stricken orbiter that's recorded. Based on math and luminosity, they think that this piece was about eight pounds in weight. The breakup of Columbia had begun and there was nothing that could be done. At 151 and 24 seconds, the mechanical maintenance arm and crew systems officer at mission control notified the flight director of the off-nominal hydraulic line temperature values. At this point, the superheated gas was chewing through the lines, cutting wires and taking sensors offline. But no one knew that yet. As the people on the ground filmed, more and more pieces came off of Columbia. And they weren't small pieces. Debris 6, for example, they thought was a few hundred pounds in mass. But the crew had no idea about anything that was happening to their shuttle. From the flight deck, all seemed to be going well. Speaking of the crew, at 1.54 and 30 seconds, the cabin sensors detected a change in the O2 partial pressure, meaning that more and more crew members were fully suiting up as the orbiter re-entered. As they did that, at 1.36 and 30 seconds, the roll reversal happened. The shuttle went from a right-wing low configuration to a left-wing low configuration. This was bad news. Now, the left wing was bearing the full brunt of the air that was hitting the shuttle. To fix this, the computer just commanded more and more left trim. The trim values were nowhere where they were supposed to be for this phase of flight. Then, at 158 and 39 seconds, the crew of Columbia get their first hint that something is wrong. They get four fault messages that say that they had lost pressure on the left main landing gear tires. Mission Control also saw these messages. Now, the crew had trained for an error like this, but it wasn't quite the same as training, as only the left-hand tires seemed to be affected. But in the training sim, this was due to a circuit breaker tripping. But in this case, that was not the case. At 1.58 and 48 seconds, the crew tried to reach mission control on radio, but they were having a hard time getting through the plasma that had engulfed the shuttle. It was making it very hard for the radio waves to get through. At 1.59 and 06 p.m. GMT, 10 seconds after the four faults that the crew got, they got an even more concerning warning. The left landing gear was extended. Now, the shuttle was giving them mixed signals. On one hand, they had a warning that said that the left main landing gear was down, but their instruments told them that the gear door was locked and the gear was stowed. It must have been puzzling for the crew to be presented with diametrically opposing information. And on top of that, no one else in the shuttle program had ever seen anything like this. In reality, all of this was due to the wires in the belly of the shuttle being destroyed due to the intense heat from the plasma. Right as all of this was happening, at 1.59 and 29 seconds GMT, the aileron had done all that it could. It was just counteracting the left yaw as best as it could, but it wasn't enough. The drag on the left wing was just too much. So one second later, the computer fired the R2R and R3R RCS jets. The RCS, or Reaction Control System, is used to orient the space shuttle in space, because, you know, in space there's no air, therefore no aerodynamic control. And on re-entry, they fire in quick bursts just to keep the shuttle where it needs to be. But on Columbia, these jets started firing continuously. In the cockpit, a small light illuminated to show that this was happening, but it was easy to miss, and no one on the flight deck probably even noticed it. At 1.51 and 32 seconds, 
The crew of Columbia was responding to a call from Mission Control. Commander Rick D. Husband said, Roger, uh... And then the signal cut out. They had lost the signal for Columbia. Now, this was planned. You see, during re-entry, the plasma gets so hot that it messes with the radio signals, meaning that for a while you have a comms blackout. This is normal. But no one at the time knew that this would be the last time that they would hear from Columbia. She would not come out of the other side of this comms blackout. As this happened, Mission Control thinks that Columbia has had an issue with landing your deployment. Now, in the grand scheme of things, that's a small issue. And moreover, they had time to troubleshoot it. No one knew about the drag on the left wing. We now get to phase three. Now the crew of Columbia is well and truly on their own. They have no way of contacting the outside world, and they're faced with warnings and situations that no other crew in the history of the program has faced. But thanks to the OEX recorder, we know what's happening to the shuttle. At 1.59 and 33 seconds, the crew is hit with another warning. This time it's telling them that the flight control system channel 4 has been bypassed in the control loop, and this triggered a master alarm. Now, that must have been scary for the crew to see their situation just deteriorate like that so quickly. Their training dictated that they do a message reset to clear the faults. But this wasn't an ordinary flight anymore, and they probably did their best to diagnose and troubleshoot the problem. They would have been trying to figure out if some common system could be responsible for all of the warnings that they were receiving. Then, at 1.59 and 36 seconds, the third RCS jet started firing and then the fourth and last one. The computer was literally doing everything in its power to keep the space shuttle from tumbling out of control. Okay, so there's a 25 second gap here where the data searches switch. We know what happened in those 25 seconds, except for the fact that we don't have accurate timestamps. So here's what happened. In the cockpit, a roll left warning was triggered at about 1.59 and 46 seconds. This meant that the dragger in the orbiter was outside of the re-entry profile. Then, at some point in that 25 second gap, the temperature in the left wing got so hot that the hydraulic lines that had been routed through there broke, draining all of the hydraulic lines and the hydraulic system failed. The lifeblood of Columbia that was helping her fight the damage had been taken away from her. Without the hydraulics, the elevons just go limp, which meant that the orbiter could no longer counteract the left yaw. This caused the nose of Columbia to pitch up at a very high rate. She was starting to spin out of control. Now, the orbiter was out of control, and the path that Columbia took was determined by the ballistic number, and since the drag was so much more higher now, the path of descent became much more steep. Footage from the ground taken at 1.59 and 36 seconds, which, by the way, is when they think that the hydraulics failed, clearly showed a corkscrew orbiter trail, meaning that Columbia was tumbling. The video shows parts breaking away from a central bright blob. Meanwhile, on board Columbia, the left wing had disintegrated and the left OMS pod was thrown clear of the vehicle. The orbiter was now in a slow flat spin, and it is important to note that the belly of the orbiter was still facing into the wind. Just to note, at this point they were traveling at Mach 15. Mach 15, that's 15 times the speed of sound. At those speeds, you could travel between LA and New York in under half an hour. At this point, inside the orbiter, the G-forces probably would have pushed them into their seats and they likely would have braced while they tried to troubleshoot the problem, and they were really trying their best. The data showed that sometime between 1.59 and 37.4 seconds and 2 p.m. and 5 seconds, one of the crew members responded to a fault message on the keyboard. As the orbiter spun around, someone had accidentally bumped the rotational hand controller. Remember how this happened before? Someone then rectified this mistake. This showed that they were still fighting to save Columbia, and they were conscious. Inside the shuttle payload bay doors, Freon was still flowing through the radiators normally. This meant that the payload doors were still intact at this point. Once this data stream ended, we know that the payload doors of the shuttle came off allowing the hot gases to hit the exposed payload bay and destroying all the circuitry there. We get a unique glimpse into what the crew of Columbia was doing at this time from a cockpit panel that was recovered from the wreck of Columbia. It was the APU panels. Till this point, all three of the APUs or auxiliary power units were up and running and the hydraulic lines were dead. 
From the crew's perspective, this would have looked like an APU failure. To fix this, the pilot of Columbia, William McCool, tried to restart two of the three APUs in an attempt to get the hydraulics back online. He also turned on two of the hydraulic circulation pumps. This would have given them some hydraulic power had the lines not been breached. Now, this step wasn't on any emergency checklist. McCool was doing this because he knew the systems of the space shuttle that well. Can we just take a moment to understand how good these people were at their job? Think about it for a moment. He's traveling at Mach 15, hundreds of thousands of feet up in the air, in an orbiter that's spinning out of control, and he still had the presence of mind to come up with a solution of his own to the problem that he was facing that would have at least partially worked had the orbiter not been in such bad shape. But as the seconds ticked by, the stresses on what was left of Columbia and her crew grew. Then the shuttle could take no more. Phase 4 At 2 p.m. and 18 seconds GMT, the shuttle broke up over the southern United States. We know the exact time because there was a GPS miniaturized airborne global receiver experiment in the forebody powered by a fuel cell in the payload bay. 2 p.m. and 18 seconds is the last time recorded by the experiment. As the main body of the space shuttle broke up, the crew compartment broke free. The same thing happened with Challenger. When the shuttle broke apart, the crew compartment had broken away. But as soon as the forebody that housed the crew separated, the aerodynamics of the situation entirely changed. As the forebody was being flung around, the internal pressure vessel stuck the fuselage, cracking the fuselage and the pressure vessel. We know this because a mission patch that was in the volume E compartment inside the shuttle was found on the ground. We were able to estimate when it was released from the shuttle with a lot of math. At this point, the pressurization inside the shuttle was starting to fail. The orbiter had lost all power and it was tumbling around. Over the next few seconds, the cracks in the forebody grew and the pressurization system totally failed. But even as the forebody tumbled, the aft bulkhead held for a while. But it wouldn't for much longer as the forebody was picking up rotational speed at about 0.5 rotations a second. Phase 5 Even though the forebody had held together mostly till this point, the stresses were just too much. The front part of the forebody fell off, exposing the crew module to the temperatures of re-entry. The structure was never designed to handle anything like this. Then, at 2 p.m. and 53 seconds, the forebody was destroyed. Ground cameras had been able to see the forebody until this point, but after 2 p.m. and 53 seconds, nothing could be seen. In less than 15 seconds, the crew module was no more. The investigators did some thermal analysis on the parts that were recovered from the forward area, and those parts told the investigators that most of the thermal damage on them happened after the module had broken up. At this point, Columbia was in pieces. The smaller pieces decelerated quickly and denser parts of the orbiter, like the engines, kept going and experienced more heating. It was estimated that the very small things, like small pieces of cloth, would take about 33 minutes to fall down to Earth, whereas the engines, which were a lot heavier, would hit the ground much sooner. But they'd cover more distance from the point of separation. By 2.35 p.m. GMT, all pieces of the forebody had reached the surface of the Earth. Columbia had been lost. We all know what happened next. The shuttle was grounded and changes had been made. We did not lose another shuttle till it was retired in 2011. Usually on this channel, I don't talk about the people involved in accidents like this. I usually focus on the technical aspects of things. But come on, this is Columbia. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge the seven brave souls on board. Commander Rick Husband, Pilot William McCool, Mission Specialist Michael Anderson, Mission Specialist Kalpana Chawla, Mission Specialist David Brown, Mission Specialist Laurel Clark, and Mission Specialist Ilan Ramon. These incredible people were our best and brightest, and they pushed the boundaries of science and technology while they were in orbit and did amazing work. Their sacrifice was not in vain, though. Lessons learned from Columbia are keeping our astronauts safe to this very day. For example, take SpaceX's spacesuit. It's designed to be fully pressurized all the way to orbit and back, so if something like a cabin air leak did occur, the astronauts would be safe. Moreover, the suits are custom-made for each astronaut, meaning that in the event of high G's or non-nominal acceleration, 
The suit would be less likely to cause an injury to the astronaut as it fits the astronaut's bodies much better. Look at the seats on Crew Dragon. See how it gently cups the astronaut with retainers on either side? Well, that would better protect the astronauts if there were to be undue longitudinal Gs. Now, I don't have a source that says these design decisions are inspired from Columbia explicitly. I was reading the Columbia Accident Report that was published in the early 2000s, and they had recommendations to make future spaceflight much safer. And many of their recommendations reminded me of design decisions made by SpaceX in the design of their Dragon spacecraft. Personally, I'd like to think that this is due to the lessons learned from the crash of Columbia. It's important to keep those lessons in mind as we as a species reach beyond our planet into the great unknown in the coming years. Clear skies and tailwinds, Columbia. Godspeed.